Hey there, I'm Lee Ullman here with some big news from the National Young Farmers Coalition. We're partnering with Heritage Radio Network on a special season of The Farm Report. It's all about what's happening with the Farm Bill and how it impacts farmers and eaters. I am growing diversified vegetables on land that's been in our family for 150 years. And so with the pandemic, gentrification, property values going up, we had to sell the land and we lost it. Join us as we uncover the untold stories behind this massive piece of legislation that shapes how we grow our food, what we eat, and so much more. The problems we have had, those are things that come from earlier Farm Bill and USDA policy, right? Like Earl Butts, get big or get out. You know, it's my responsibility to know not only what I'm eating, but then like how, how that all came to be and realize like, wow, like this piece of legislation, all this money, like it's technically something that I support as a taxpayer. While Congress debates the next Farm Bill, this is not just an invitation to listen. It's a call to action. Be part of the conversation. Subscribe to the Farm Report on Heritage Radio Network wherever you listen to podcasts. You're listening to Heritage Radio Network. With more than 30 weekly podcasts, HRN has something for every food and drink lover. Learn more at heritageradionetwork.org. This episode is brought to you by Diageo Bar Academy. Learn more at diageobaracademy.com. That's D-I-A-G-E-O baracademy.com. So you don't shun the devil with your rock and roll load. Knows that country music's gonna save your soul. The devil runs his groove in them rhythm and blues. That's him. It's gonna get you sun in the air. Welcome back to The Speakeasy. I'm Damon Bolte. I'm Souther Teague. And I'm Greg Benson. Jim. My guys. Yeah, yeah. We missed you last week, buddy. Yeah, man. Sorry about that. Uh, you know, sometimes uh, work travel kind of gets in the way, and uh, but that's why we that's why there's three of us. You know, that's right. Show must go on every week. Show must go on. Speaking and we're on track. On, we'll yeah, we're on show. track to uh, get it uh, just about our 500th episode by the end of this year. Am I correct on that, Greg? I you are correct gonna, about that. Well, actually, I early, think we're early next into it in year, January. Yeah, yeah, right around when the 12th okay. anniversary of this show is, which is. Very Crazy cool. to me. I, I can't imagine doing any one thing for twelve years. <laughs> Hats off yeah. to you, Damon. It's 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 the, it's a, the it's show a is almost a teenager. It's weird. <laughs> it's my kid. Um, I'm gonna catch him drinking yeah. soon. <laughs> that's about when I started. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's a different episode, guys. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. Guys, what happened over? <laughs> yeah, yeah. What happened over the weekend? Uh, well, I was invited to be one of the um, sort of cadre of uh, bartenders that got behind the bar at Lullaby to benefit the departure of our beloved brother Cleve, uh, along with uh, Misty Kalkofen, um John Gertz, uh, Dave Wondrich got behind the bar and made drinks. It was incredible. Wow. Uh, Joaquin Simo, myself, uh, the, I'm forgetting a bunch of people. It's quite a blur. Um, Phil Duff. Uh, I don't know. It was, a, it was a great evening. We raised quite a great deal of money because, as you are probably aware, everything in the United States of America is expensive, even death. So, a unexpected death right. is expensive. And then the fact that he was, Cleve was in in L.A. Of course, he lives in, lived in Boston. He was in L.A. when he when he uh, passed, uh, getting his remains shipped all the way back across the country. Another expense that's unexpected. So. I mm-hmm. uh, think right. we did a pretty good job. We can put in the show notes the GoFundMe. It's still operating. Uh, but uh, last I checked, uh, uh, with the bar tab that was entirely donated by the bar, all tips, all proceeds, every every penny that came across the bar went to the fund. Wow. Um, I think we were at 13000 last I looked. So hopefully covering those unexpected and uh, untimely expenses for Cleve, who was our dear friend. Yeah. Wow. Good, good job. It's, yeah, uh, it, that's, it that's, was... Uh, uh, you know, humans need that, right? We got to gather together, commiserate, uh, share the misery. Um, I mean, that's commiserate. That's what that means, right? So we laughed, we cried, we lots of hugs and high fives. And, you know, it was uh, it was quite an evening of, you know, it was awake. That's what it was. And it was uh, awake in only the way that I think a group of uh, hospitality folks can can do it, which is full tilt and, and all go. Yep. Loud and 100% with a lot of booze. Yeah, that's yeah, what we did for sure much rum was enjoyed 
Well, what else happened this week? Uh, well, the very next night, uh, I went over to Porchlight here in New York City to check out uh, uh, the launch of Modern Classic Cocktails, which, of course, is uh, Robert's book, and we're going to talk to him in just a few minutes. Cool. Did you uh, get any beef jerky to uh, overnight to me from Porchlight? Damn. You know, I didn't even think about that. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't even get beef jerky myself. They should have had like a big table of beef jerky out there for everyone. I completely I like forgot. Every one of their book parties, in my opinion, should have beef jerky. But then I also think about people thumbing through the pages after like having <laughs> sticky like beef jerky fingers. Because those things are pretty saucy, too. Their beef jerky is. So... Maybe you have it like as, as like a as like a like a like a it's gift bag, like a party bag. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, like you know the the bar up in um, uh, up in the upper upper Wisconsin where you uh, where you put your thumbprint on the card with the uh, Angostura bitters. Maybe you could thumbprint with oh, right, the yeah. with, with the, the barbecue jerky. sauce on the beef jerky. <laughs> <laughs> I love this idea. Yeah, it really it really ups the value of the resale of the book. Yeah, and there's no uh, you know identity theft. <laughs> or anything like that happened. It's like, <laughs> can you sign this to your mother, but sign it to her maiden name and then, uh, you know, put your thumbprint on this and <laughs> yeah, right. uh, uh, jot down the last four of your social. Oh man. Well, uh, I'm sure it was heavily attended. Uh, it was, and I was shocked. It was raining. We were getting the last bit of rain from Ian pushing up the East coast. Uh, it was pretty cold. New York is shifting into winter time and the house was packed. I mean, like it was shoulder to shoulder when I got there and I got there pretty early nice. and I stayed, I stayed till the very last, the last two people to leave were myself and Tiki Adam. <laughs> <laughs> of course. Uh, yeah. That makes sense. That all tracks. Yeah. <laughs> well, speaking of this book in this person, um, not Tiki Adam, but Robert Simonson happens to be in the studio with us today. We want to welcome him to the show. Welcome back to the show, Robert. Hello guys. Glad to be here. Yeah, I mean, how many man. how many times have you been on now? You're like the most regular regular. You get you get a is that get right? you a jacket. I think so. I mean, you, you keep writing uh, books, and we keep having you on. I think <laughs> I think this may be my fifth time. So yeah, it yeah. could be like a yeah. Saturday Night Live. You got to get me a red velvet glow. jacket. Yeah, yeah. yeah, that's right. We'll get that. It'll be covered in barbecue sauce, but you know, <laughs> yeah, you still it's a thought that counts. <laughs> it started as a white velvet jacket, but uh, you know, <laughs> leather elbows. By the way, Damon, I agree with you on the beef jerky. I always order it when I go to Porch Light. And I don't know. I didn't order it uh, you were on busy. Monday night. I don't know why. You were but, busy um, chatting. I didn't eat anything. I was chatting with so many people. It was like a, another... I think that, you know, it, it seems that things are finally coming back to life uh, in our world. And I just keep... You know, the events that keep happening, I keep seeing so many people. So I think... Uh, yeah, I, was, I think I people too, are... too busy talking to eat anything. I think people are starved for these events, and so, yeah, a lot mm -hmm. of people did come out. And, of course, we had the great lineup behind the bar. Uh, Joaquin Simo, Don Lee, Megan Dorman, and Frankie Marshall all serving drinks. That was pretty special. Yeah, all serving their drinks that are featured in the book, right? That's right. They, they, they were serving their signature drinks. So your fifth time being on the show, is this your fifth book? Or have you, do you have more than uh, that? And we haven't gotten you on the show for those. <laughs> yeah, I think you missed one somewhere. I, it is my sixth cocktail book, okay. actually. Yeah. And this one has a great premise and a great um, sort of setup. Modern Classic Cocktails is the name of the book. Talk about um, what it takes to be a modern, what a modern classic cocktail is. Talk about what that is. Yeah, modern classic cocktail. I mean, uh, they're cocktails that come from like the last 25 years, basically um, the span of what we call the cocktail revival, the cocktail renaissance, whatever you want to call it. Um, and uh, these cocktails have shown some staying power. They've shown some legs. You know, they didn't just, uh, they weren't a flash in the pan. They, they, they stuck around. And, and uh, what it takes, uh, well, uh, I, in the introduction of the book, I kind of detail what I think um, has to be the case, you know, what the criteria are. Uh, one of them is it has to travel beyond the bar where it was invented. Other bars have to serve it. Um, and uh, that de facto means that other bartenders respect the drink, that they regard the drink as um, something worthy, you know, something worthy of their cocktail list at their bar in their city. Uh, it has to be... Uh, I mean, that I, alone is no small feat, right? To get a, another establishment's team on board with your creation in a field where creativity is, is kind of what a lot of people crave. Yeah, I mean, you guys know better than I do. I mean, you all 
bartenders have standards, you know, and you're not going to put a drink on your menu and, if you don't and think egos. it's a good drink. That's right, <laughs> egos too. So it's a it's a great <laughs> act of um, of humility, you know, to say that is a fantastic drink, and I am going to put the drink by uh, my fellow bartender on my menu. It's always flattering to me whenever I get a request to put one of my drinks on a menu that's like in Tucson or, you know, Portland or wherever it might be, even another bar in New York. And it certainly is a, it's a, it's a showing of respect for other people in your industry and kind of the best way that you can, you know, um, I feel like another criteria if, unless I don't want to get ahead of you here, but I always feel like most modern classics say something, you know, obviously, like you said, made in the last 20, 25 years around that era, they're usually made up of ingredients you could have gotten in, say, the first cocktail book in 1862 by Jerry Thomas, like liqueurs and spirits that existed over 100 years ago and in- ingredients to, to go along with that. Would you uh, agree with that? Or is that something that you've seen with most of these? Well, I think it was important uh, during the cocktail revival, a lot of those ingredients that had either been lost or forgotten or neglected uh, came back. Uh, Mixologists like yourself, you know, just insisted, you know, they needed these things. They needed rye and absinthe and creme de violette and what have you so that they could create these old cocktails again. And once they had the spirits and the liqueurs on hand, they had the weapons needed to create new great cocktails. Right. Yeah, for sure. There's one that I, it's probably my favorite, what I consider a modern classic. Uh, it's a PDT cocktail from Nate Dumas. It's called Montgomery Smith and it's Brandy, Benedictine and Fernet. And I mean, how could you go wrong with that? But it's funny whenever you, when you look back on some of these, or not, not even that far back on some of these modern classics to the ingredients that are being used. Like for instance, the, the oldest, uh, well, actually I'd say the youngest ingredient that's in that cocktail is 177 years old so i mean when you think about it that way and in, in this cocktail this mixture of these three ingredients had never happened before so it's it's fascinating to see that it's not all been done you know as, as someone who does create drinks i mean greg sutter wouldn't you agree that like there's there's always more to learn and there's always more to be you know composed of these ingredients yeah yeah absolutely it's the it's um what someone described to me as the the Taco Bell phenomenon, where there's no such thing as <laughs> yeah. a new idea, you know, and in much the same way that Taco Bell only uses the same seven things, but they've just become masters at endlessly right. recombining them in weird ways that there's like, like, they have like a, yeah, they have like a million things on their menu. It's like, we're going to put this hard taco inside of a soft tortilla and it's a new thing now. And I think that that's, you know, I, I, I love the idea that that can apply to any sort of creative field. It's like, you're never going to, you know, you can, I mean, I don't know, in in this (laughs) sense, you can, you can go out and be like, Hey, like here's this really awesome new ingredient, like the, um, the elote liqueur that I just picked up Nixta, which I I, I think, I think is really interesting. I think that's cool. And I'm loving playing around with it, but you know, there's also so much to be said for taking what's already out there and just endlessly finding the ways to recombine it because you'll never see the bottom of it. You know, the upside down burrito. Yeah. Yes. The new Taco Bell upside down burrito. <laughs> what does it even mean? Yeah. Um, I want it. I want that to exist. <laughs> you got to oh, yeah, go fast before it all falls out of your lap. That's sure. the challenge. Yeah. And it's extreme. Well, the bartenders, yeah, it. the bartenders that, you know, came of age in, um, you know, in the last 20 years, they had a, a lucky circumstance because the bartending profession, it hadn't really been called on to be creative for a long time. So suddenly around 2000, 2005, it's like bartenders were given, um, you know, the liberty or the, a new lease on their profession to be creative, create new drinks. And so say they, they kind of had a blank slate to work with um, because the whole idea of creating new cocktails was not really something that restaurants or bars were demanding. And so I think that's one of the reasons why we ended up with all these modern classics in such a short period of time. And it was a short period of time. I mean... I would say more than 50% of the drinks in the book are from like 2005 to 2012. Right. Yeah. And I'd, I'd love to sort of ask you about, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm the, I'm the history guy. I love geeking out about this stuff. So I sort of was, was really looking forward to asking you, like you look at these drinks and you look at this period of time and sort of what does, 
studying what happened then and all of these, you know, enduring modern classics that have come out of it, what what did that sort of tell you about this era and the zeitgeist and sort of what was what was going on not all that long ago, but in a period of time that, you know, is is at this point, you know, if you were to do a if you were to set a movie in two thousand five, at this point it would be a period piece, which makes me feel old to say That's out true. loud, but it's true. You know, <laughs> yes. so what is it what is what can you what did you learn about that that particular era by writing this book? Well, what happened in that era in the late aughts and the early tens was just like this perfect storm of um, circumstances. First of all, you had these uh, bartenders who were eager to be creative and were being encouraged to be creative. Um, then you had the return of all these uh, forgotten and lost uh, spirits. I mean, just, just think about it. Like 15 years ago, uh, rye was hard to find and, right. and absinthe wasn't even legal. Um, and so suddenly they had these tools again. Um, there were dedicated cocktail bars. That was a new phenomenon. Bars that were focused on the cocktail. Let's not and, forget bitters. Just yeah. like Peixot yeah. bitters. Or, orange bitters were still rare, you know, in like the yeah. mid-aughts. Yeah, yeah. I You mean, could you make could... a Sazerac, you know, basically. You had no absinthe. You had no well, rye, that You know. <laughs> exactly. That's the classic example. You in New York, you couldn't make a Sazerac because it was hard to find rye. You couldn't get Peixot's bitters. There was no absinthe. It was just basically an impossible puzzle. But now the puzzle all, is all put together. Yeah. Yeah. So, Robert, can you go on and talk about um, the remaining criteria to, to make it uh, as a modern classic cocktail that you've, uh, well, that you've outlined at least? Yes. Um, uh, the, the obvious one, you know, the duh criteria is that people must like it. You know, it, it can't just be liked by us. You know, I mean, uh, we're just... We're the, the, the nerds, you mean? Yeah, the nerds, the elitists, the epicures. It can't just be that. It has to catch on, you know, and people have to go to bars and say, I want a Tommy's margarita. Can you make one? I want a paper, I want a paper plane. I want a penicillin. So that has to happen. Um, it helps, I think, if these... Recipes are printed and reprinted. We've had a flood of cocktail books in the past 10 years. And many of the recipes in this book, in my book, have already been published in many other books. And so that helps them get around as well. Um, the funniest criteria, and this, this only occurred to me in the last two years after interviewing a bunch of these bartenders, is that after a while, the drink, the modern classic, becomes so established that people think it was invented 100 years ago. Right. Um, and right, they, like a historical confusion. <laughs> like, Damon, have you ever had trouble convincing someone you invented the hard start? Oh, yeah. The Applejack Sazerac is another one. Um, they're just like, oh, no, that just makes sense that it would have been made back in, you know, the 1870s, 1880s, and... and it's like, uh, well, no, I swear that was my dream. <laughs> but I, what's really incredible, I think, to go along with that is, um, when when to kind of like expand on what you're saying is, when you go into a bar and you just like all of a sudden a paper plane is as ubiquitous as a martini. Yes, yes, exactly. you know what I mean. It's it like there's so many new drinkers out there that like they don't know that. Like that, they don't know that they'll go to Attaboy and they'll order a paper plane, not even knowing that Sam Ross invented that or the penicillin, because you can order those drinks on like airplanes now. You know, it's like it's crazy. So yeah, of course, when you see that on like a menu at say, I don't know, Chili's or something like that, you know, you're like, okay, of course, it's an old drink. It has. Yeah, to be. it's it's amazing the surprising places you will see some of these modern cocktails yeah. pop up. In like a small bar in the middle of nowhere, or like you said, at the airport. Um, another uh, criterion, which kind of indicates to you that uh, a drink is on its way to being a classic, is when, I mean, a lot of modern classics are riffs on classics. But then the modern classic gets established and people start to riff on the modern classic. So we mm -hmm. all know that there are many riffs on the penicillin, on mm -hmm. the paper plane, on all these drinks, on the espresso martini. And so that's another thing. Yeah. Yeah, I love that one. And and we talked off air briefly. You know, Damon, you have The Hard Start is in Robert's book here, which is mm -hmm. just a 50-50 a mix of uh, Fernet Branca and Branca Mentha done as a, a shot. Um, actually, you know, just really quickly, that's actually a variation on an actual cocktail that I made called The Waterfront when I was living in <laughs> that's Red That's true. That's true. <laughs> so it's actually just the the alcoholic base of The Waterfront 
the waterfront has the most fernet you can ever put in a cocktail. It's two ounces of fernet, <laughs> one ounce bronca minta, <laughs> lime and ginger beer. And that's obviously a, a kind of a variation on a buck or a mule or however you want to look at it. Um, but then just to get straight to the point, we just left out the lime and ginger beer at brunch one morning. And that's how the hard start came about. So, yeah, it is incredible to see how they they kind of uh, become modified. Of and course, actually, that I, drink was invented to get you through brunch. Of co- It makes yeah, so right, much sense. How yeah. did I not? It's like the, the end of the start. usual <laughs> suspects. It's like, how did I not see this before? Yeah. And actually, there are two drinks in the uh, book. Like, there's the Gold Rush and the Penicillin, both created at Milk and Honey. But the penicillin is actually a riff on the gold rush. So mm-hmm. there's this weird circle, this loop, this closed loop over at Milk and Honey. Right. And my my we talked off the air, my variation on the hard start also leans towards brunch. I made it into food. I, <laughs> I cured I cured salmon with Fernet Brunca and I whipped Brunca menta into cream cheese and we met, we had the hard start bagel. That's hey. so flattering. <laughs> It was delicious. Uh, it was no, delicious. It's, it's, it sounds I, delicious. I did them both for a double buzz so many years ago, but then also I sold 60 pounds of salmon and cream cheese at the beginning of the pandemic when I was struggling to figure out how to make money. You know what? You just reminded me of something. Uh, we So one of your old bartenders, Aaron Polsky, who makes live wire drinks, um, he and I had this weird thing that we did for a, a hot moment. It was it was like rock and roll cocktail show when we did at Portland cocktail week, we did all these crazy cocktails on stage with light shows and music. And it was in just the most insane thing ever, but we wanted to make the the waterfront into like an edible cocktail that was passed around to the crowd. So we found a local ice cream uh, maker to make it into like a sorbet and the, the cocktails garnished with uh mint sprig. Right. But we found out that they had a, uh, a snow machine up on the ceiling in the like theater that would go out over the crowd. So we actually had SOS chef and the Lower East side make us a really highly concentrated peppermint hydrosol and put it in the snow machine up on the roof on the ceiling. And so we were like, Oh crap, we forgot the garnish. Hold on a second. And then the snow machine turned on and everyone started getting snowed on like mint snow and it was like, it was like the weirdest thing. Okay, so that is. I remember. It was exactly. Cripple Creek, right? Yeah, exactly. But, I mean, talk about, like, the advancement of modern classic into something completely, like, weird and different. Absurdist. Okay. Yeah, that was pretty crazy. But but I think going back to, you know, I think, to me, it's, it's funny because now that I'm out here in, like, Marin County and I work in Napa and Sonoma and, uh, and all around California, really, um, I, you know, I'll see these menus put together at just like kind of a pretty the nice place, standard place, but they they didn't really come up with a lot of their own cocktails. And I'll look at it, and it'll be like pretty much all modern classics, like the Oaxacan Old Fashioned, the Sawyer, the you know everything that Sam Ross has ever made. You know, like half the <laughs> menu is Sam Ross, but it's crazy because I you know I'll try and talk with some of these bartenders about it, and like so like do you know like. It's like, these are all New York bartenders. And they're like, yeah, you know, we just wanted to keep it pretty classic. I'm like, no, but you understand these guys are all alive and they're younger than me. <laughs> you know, like, or they're my age at least. <laughs> but like, it's it's so weird. And they're like, what are you talking about? This is like from like the 1920s or something. I'm like, no, man, it's from like the 2020s. Yeah, you know, yeah. it's, well, that's, it's crazy. That's, that's, uh, that's one of the reasons I, I wanted to write the book. I sort of felt, I mean... This is all recent history, but it's becoming mm-hmm. distant history. And we all know, you know, how forgetful Americans are. It's like we forget right. our history. When we were starting this cocktail revival, we had to like go back to the old books and the old newspaper clippings to right. figure out what all the old cocktails were and how to make them. And mm-hmm. I saw no reason for that to be the case this time. So I, I reached out to all the original creators of the drinks. I got the recipes directly from the bartenders, so they're not so they're they're accurate. You put them all in a book between covers and, you know, hopefully some of these young bartenders will pick it up and they'll say, oh, that's where it came from. And that's how you make it. I kind of love that idea of this book is like, you know, a, a, a time capsule and doing I mean, you know, we've we've talked a lot on this show and I'm sure every everyone who is a listener knows that like trying to find the origin stories of some of these cocktails is you know, it's the 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 mystery. The journey is itself the destination sometimes. But at the end of the day, it's like very difficult to pinpoint exactly, you know, 
Mm-hmm. We don't really know the exact origins of you well, know, people were drinking when they made these or things. The martini or <laughs> right. yeah, ex- exactly. But like right. you know, we, we have we have legends, but that's it. So I just love the idea of like, okay, I'm gonna set we're we're gonna set the record straight this time. <laughs> this yeah, time I've, we're gonna write it I've all long down. since I've long since resigned myself to the idea that you know I'm never gonna know the origin of the Manhattan, the martini, or the old fashioned, you know. But I can know the origin of these drinks. There's no reason why not, and so here they are. Well, another cool thing is that, you know, usually with books, if you kind of like find out earlier information, you do a revision, your second, third pressing, you also had the app, um, Modern Classic Cocktails, which is obviously it's an app, so it's modifiable. Uh, If if new information comes out, it becomes updated. And, you know, but I, I think that what you were just talking about with this book is that Luckily, you know all these bartenders, and so you could get the, you know, straight from the horse's mouth, as they say. That's true. I mean, I mean yeah. I've been writing about this, uh, about cocktails for 16 years now. So I know all the bartenders, and it was, uh, you know, easy to reach out to them. And uh, I'm, I'm very grateful that they trust me with their stories, and they, they told it to me in as much detail as they could remember. Right. Well, you're 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 noted uh, noted known and trustworthy, so uh, I think it's uh, it's not not a big hurdle to get over. Let's take a quick break here and hear from our sponsors. We'll come right back and keep talking with our friend Robert Simonson about his new book, Modern Classic Cocktails. Hey, hey, you, yeah, you. Do you want to try your hand at the biggest bartending competition in the world? because the November 15th application deadline is quickly approaching for the 2023 season of USBG Presents World Class, sponsored by Diageo. World Class US is more than just a competition. It offers a great opportunity for cocktail enthusiasts of every skill level and background to test themselves, join a community of industry professionals from around the world, and ultimately become a stronger, more confident bartender. The global finals for this year just wrapped up in Sydney, Australia, and next year's finals are going to be in Sao Paulo, Brazil. DiageoBarAcademy.com hosts best-in-class educational content from world-class studios, and this is the biggest competition in the industry, and applications are open to all hospitality professionals age 21 and up. Diageo Bar Academy has all the resources you need to prepare yourself to be a world-class bartender. That's whether you're a seasoned bartender or you're just getting started in your career. Anybody can visit DiageoBarAcademy.com and click on the World Class tab for more information. So don't wait. Visit DiageoBarAcademy.com to build your skills. Plus, there's a new Virtual Bar and Members Week right around the corner. These resources are for members only, but it's completely free to sign up, so don't sleep on it. Go to DiageoBarAcademy.com today. That's D-I-A-G-E-O baracademy.com and I'll see you there. And we are back. You were listening to the Speakeasy here on Heritage Radio Network. Today we're talking with Robert Simonson, author of Modern Classic Cocktails, and we're talking about what exactly makes a modern classic cocktail. So, you know, we've talked about the fact that people have to like it. We've talked about the fact that it has to travel beyond the place where it's invented. What are some of the other things that that drinks some of the other uh, hurdles drinks need to clear in order to make it into this book well uh, like um souther was mentioning uh, to me earlier uh it, it has to be pretty easy to make um uh i think all the uh, drinks in this book um anyone can make at home they can find the ingredients i think the most complicated is the the benton's old-fashioned which is <laughs> a big a bacon fat washed old-fashioned that succeeded in spite of itself for some reason and it's actually made uh, everywhere even though you actually have to it's i mean it's uh, i don't know how many uh, at least one day process to make it people go bananas for bacon man it's just i don't yeah. i don't get it but i'm done fighting it i, I think you can just buy <laughs> bacon whiskey now so there are a couple syrups in there you know honey syrups such like that but um none of them are too complicated uh i was in uh Long Island Bar uh, the other day, and I was talking to uh, our friend Phil Ward, bartender, about this subject. And I asked him, what, what, how, what does it take to be a modern classic? And the first thing he said, he said, it has to be easy to make. It can't have, like, unicorn tears in it. Mm-hmm. Agreed. 
Right. Well, as you as you mentioned on the top half of the show, uh, you know, the arsenal of weaponry that we have at our disposal now that we didn't have even 20, 25 years ago um, means that we don't have we can build cocktails out of delicious things that already exist without having to make so many things to prop them up. That's right. That's right. Right. And like we mentioned before, also, it's like you, you, get, you can find these like people are making them on airplanes, not not saying anything. It's like flight attendants and their their abilities to make drinks, but they're just not set up with a bar in there to do that. So, like, if you can order one of these classic cocktails or modern classic cocktails on a flight, it's got to be easy to make. And a lot of times equal parts, too. Yeah. Noticed. Yeah. Equal parts also makes it easy. I mean, that's the that's the whole point of this, isn't it? I mean, I I. Whenever I do any of my books or, or whenever I'm like doing a post uh, um, on my Substack newsletter and I have a recipe, and I often have recipes on my post, I make sure it's a simple one because the whole point is you want the people to make the drink, not just right. look at it and admire it and say, wouldn't that be nice? You, know? <laughs> yeah. you, want, you want them to make it that night and you want them to drink it. Right. Yeah, without, too much, without too much fanfare <laughs> or hassle. Um, I was talking to you a little bit as well about how many, and there's no way to, to tell, but I'd just like to hear your insight. How many great cocktails that you think might have fit all these criteria have disappeared or we never even saw them or didn't get to hear about them enough because maybe they had just a terrible name? I think that's definitely a possibility. I mean, even though this is my job, I can't try all the cocktails, even though I try very hard. Um, and so there, there have got to be, there have got to have been wonderful cocktails that just, you know, just missed. And I think there are a lot of reasons for that. You say uh, it has to have a good name. You're right. It has to have a catchy name. Hopefully it's one word or two words, um, because then it sticks in people's minds and people like to say it. A lot of the names got a little too complicated and fancy during the cocktail revival. You know, they would be like five or six words long. They'd be a quote from a song or a quote from a poem or something ridiculous. Mm -hmm. And that's that's not going to stay. That's not going to stay. Um, there are other reasons. It's, it's just luck. Like a, a reporter comes by, likes the drink, writes about it, and then somebody reads the article, decides to serve that drink at their bar, and so it catches on. Uh, I'm sure there are hundreds of wonderful cocktails that deserve better right i think if you're going to make a something that feels like a, a modern classic i mean the modern part is implied that it's new but it's got to be classic i mean you, you should name it give it a name that sounds very classic i mean the paper that'll plane, stand the test of time is you know the paper plane is obviously a modern song but it's actually a very old piece of origami too so it's it's kind of <laughs> mod it is modern and classic at the same time you know so i think that's any kind of regional name i mean like like you know there's there's lots of ways to do it but um but yeah i get i think a lot of southern what uh the ones that i've seen that have been good drinks but they kind of disappeared or didn't like they didn't catch was when they try to put something a little too like pop and like of the moment kind of trendy mm -hmm. or, you know, like, yeah, that's, that's when I see things kind of fall away. Cause then it's like, Oh, well, that's kind of weird. Well, it sounds trendy. So it must be, which means I, I, I want something more classic. I don't know. Does that make sense? I think yeah, well, so. Yeah. Souther, do you have like a, an example, um, like a drink that you think should be a classic, but it didn't succeed because mm -hmm. it had a terrible name? No, I didn't mean to be put to the test here. I would have maybe thought about that. Um, but what I was referencing was, you know, our, our good friend Jim Meehan in his book, The Meehan Manual, he said, and I tell my teams this all the time because I, I read it and I believed it so hard that I've thought about it every time I'm making a drink since. A drink's only marketing campaign is its name. And he said, he went on to say, you know, as many, as many great drinks, as, uh, as many terrible drinks that are still surviving out there because they have a great name. There are just as many, if not more, great drinks that disappeared because their name wasn't good. Yeah, and there's yeah. again, there's no way to know it. You know, I can't, I can't know what I don't know. But uh, I really do feel that there are drinks out there that that we've lost because they they had poor marketing. <laughs> I feel like I start with the name every time I come up with a drink. I, I try to start with the name first. I'm like, that would be oh, that's a great name for a cocktail, and then build off of that. You know, use that as inspiration. Really? I think I, was, I think another reason I'm, why I'm why, yeah, <laughs> yeah why some cocktails don't get a chance is because um, you know cocktail bars were perhaps too creative for a time mm -hmm. and they were constantly flipping their menu. 
um, if a drink is really good, but it only gets, you know, three months of airtime, how right. is it going to take off? It's like they say in this business too. It's like, you know, with bartenders just in general, not just their drinks, but the actual bartenders themselves, you know, they're like, Hey, I get asked this all the time uh, by like newer bartenders. Like, Hey, how can I like advance my career? I'm like, well, people need to know where to find you. So yeah, stay still. That's what I say to people. Still. Yeah. 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 I mean, uh, a lot. Uh, there are a few cocktails in this book by Audrey Saunders, who ran Pegu Club for 15 years. Mm-hmm. And one of the reasons why she has so many famous drinks credited to her is because once it went on the menu, it stayed on the menu. So over the years, the audience and the media get used to that drink, and they're, they're bound to try it, and it catches on. Julie Reiner did a similar thing at Clover Club. You know, She wanted a house martini and a house Manhattan. The martinis called the gin blossom, and the Manhattan's called the slope, and that has been on the menu since it opened in two thousand eight. Yeah. Right. Well, at at, at, at my bar, Mori Margo, we um, we vote every time the menu changes. We vote on what stays and what goes, um, and you know that that means that the Sharpie Mustache has been on the menu for I don't know nine years now. The A Tomorrow Sazerac went on the menu on day one, and it's still on the menu. You know, there are ones that are just probably never going away at this point. But uh, but I think it's you're right. It's like if you don't get enough, you know, if the movie isn't in the theater for long enough, not enough people get to see it, right? So if you don't get enough right. uh, playtime, uh, then people don't get to see the drink and and understand it and come to come to love it. A lot of drinks you have to come to, you know. Not everything is a. I don't know. I don't want to say that some drinks are an acquired taste, but a lot of drinks, if you if you haven't touched it, you you just don't know. Yeah. I wonder what the, uh, I mean, I don't know if you have the metrics on this, Robert, but I'd be curious to see just talking about like having these cocktails on a menu for a long period of time to gain visibility on it. I wonder what the fastest rising modern classic would be. Hmm. You mean the one that like, Like, uh, that gets on the menu? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Became classic, like spread like wildfire, you know? Well, I know, um, from the moment the Benton Soul Fashion was on the menu at PDT, it was an instant classic. And that's mainly yeah. because everybody in town wrote about it. Yeah. Right. Um, and I've been told by the owners of Death and & Company and by Phil Ward himself that the Iwaka Old Fashioned was popular from the get-go and was never not popular. Okay. Yeah, I kind of figured at least at least the uh, Oaxacan Old Fashioned, but I didn't really think about the Bentons like that just because I had a little extra... Uh, extra prep involved but yeah i think if it's a simple idea it'll latch on to the public's mind right away i mean just think of those names benton's old-fashioned awaka old-fashioned it's not that hard to understand right. what you're getting yeah. into it's it's kind of like calling it a gin and tonic it's like that's oh. right <laughs> you know yeah the this is an old-fashioned with, yes, yeah. this is an old fashioned <laughs> with bacon the bolty gin tonic or whatever yeah <laughs> yeah yeah robert do you foresee like maybe in the next 25 years so you you, you figure this book was a, a sweepings of the last 25 years. Do you foresee a, a, a second book in 25 years? Do you think there'll be enough new modern classics? Do you think, uh, where do you think this is going? It's, is what I'm asking. It's hard to predict the future, but <laughs> I mentioned that kind of like perfect storm, that chrysalis that happened. Uh, right. I don't know if that's going to happen again anytime soon. We've invented so many drinks. Mm-hmm. Um, I think we kind of exhausted a lot of the possibilities, uh, something that could happen is like uh, some miracle new ingredient comes around and then suddenly there are, is a host of new classics. Or, or perhaps, you know, uh, the unthinkable could, could happen and we could finally figure out, you know, how to make good cocktails out of aquavit or uh, kumbal or something <laughs> like that. Wow. <laughs> Man, fight fired. <laughs> Sorry, but people have been trying this for 15 years and there may there may be no there there. I got uh, I got one. I got a recipe for you. <laughs> Do you? De- desperately simple. Up. It's a highball 50-50 uh aquavit Irish whiskey and a lemon twist. That's it. Some about it just like super simple, the bready notes of both of those uh aged spirits. It has to be Linny Aquavit too. It doesn't work with the unaged yeah. stuff. Uh, what's but, the name? I don't have a name for it yet. Sometimes you gotta so, get a good name. Good yeah. name. I know. That's the thing is I, 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 I'm, I'm, I'm extra concerned after this conversation. It's like, I don't want to blow it. Yeah. Got to get good PR on this thing. I always say sometimes a sandwich is just a sandwich. They can't all be yeah. Rubens. You know what I Another mean? Another thing that could happen <laughs> and you can never predict this is some 
genius comes along, somebody who just knows how to make fantastic drinks and can make them one after another. You know, you never know mm-hmm. know who the next bartender to uh, arrive on the scene is. Right. What about, and this is totally random, but but I think uh, given the trends that are happening right now, it's at least worth asking. Any modern, classic, non-alcoholic cocktail? I was going to ask the same. Right? We got the Arnold Palmer. Wow. What else we got? <laughs> you know, that <laughs> has a funny. name that's lived on, that's gone forward, you know? I don't think there are any yet. That trend is so uh, young. Yeah. No, uh, there, there is no modern, classic, non-alcoholic cocktail yet. Maybe there will be. Um, I'm doubtful, but you never know. Yeah. Pretty, pretty, well, pretty rare opportunity. Let's switch gears here, Robert. I mean, like anyone who follows you on your sub stack or on your social media, otherwise, um, they probably Ooh, see a lot of supper clubs and going. hot dogs. I know where this is going. <laughs> and potato chips and regional sodas. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Which I'm go. a huge, huge fan of. Uh, I love regional sodas, especially when Court Street Grocers opened up just about a block down from Prime Meats. I was in there every day buying anything they had. Um, but I love hot dogs. And you've been posting a lot about hot dogs lately. And it's just really making me happy. Um, it's just always been an obsession of yours. I know you're from Wisconsin and supper clubs are a big thing there. And it, are hot dogs equally ubiquitous? Here? Uh, no, no, they're not actually. In Wisconsin, you, you care about bratwurst and Polish sausage and you really don't, hot dogs are kind of uninteresting to a Wisconsinite. They're, they're kind of dull. Right. Um, so the, the hot dog obsession is really, uh, recent, and it came about because of uh, my wife, Mary Kate, is from New Jersey. And mm-hmm. she, she would talk up the hot dogs of New Jersey. And after a couple of years, you know, I just said, well, let's try some of these things and see if they're actually any good. And uh, New Jersey does have a, a high uh, proportion of great old hot dog joints. And so once I tried a few and I saw that they were Excellent and interesting. And not only that, but there was a great uh, variety and history uh, there. I I just sort of started visiting more and more. And that just kind of led to upstate New York and Connecticut and Maine and Oklahoma and Chicago. Because, I mean, this is what I say to people. It's like, it's really no different from cocktails. Um, Hot dogs are an intrinsically American food, just like cocktails were invented in the Mm -hmm. United States. And um, there's a lot of ritual, and there's a lot of tradition, and there are a lot of old places run by families who've been doing it the same way. I see a lot of similarities between the two. Yeah, I I love it, and I love following your content about it uh, because I, too, am a big fan of the hot dog. Uh, Emulsified meats uh, encased in, uh, um, you know... Uh, natural natural (laughs) casings. That's that's, that's, what's. I I get two reactions to the post. Most of the. I've I've used um, the Substack, which I started in January, and it's called the Mix for anyone out there who wants to subscribe. Yeah, we'll um, put that in I've the show used notes as well. Yeah, I've used it to write the hot dog stuff because other people wouldn't let me. You know, um, <laughs> <laughs> once you're a cocktail writer, you're apparently a cocktail writer for life. Um, I think I got one opportunity. Grub Street let me write something about hot dogs, but so I use the Substack to do that and. People seem to enjoy it. Uh, they have one or two reactions. Either they are super passionate about hot dogs, just like you are, Damon, or they are revolted. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, I mean, a strong reaction is a strong reaction, right? No bad press. Yeah. yeah. And and lest we forget, you know, PDT, the Benton's Old Fashioned, uh, all, all of these modern classics that came out of there would not exist without the hot dog. That's, That's right. true. Dogs. Without Crip Crip dogs, dogs out front. Yeah. Crift Dogs was the mother of PDT. That is true. And, you know, to, to take it even further, actually, you know, there are some amazing, very famous chefs who have mm-hmm. th- their own uh, hot dogs that you can only get in, like, through the sliding door that like, from Crift Dogs, they'll, they'll slide them into PDT. Like, uh, Wiley Dufresne has one. I think David Chang had one. Like, there's... Yes. It, it's, it, so, it's like, it's almost like guest bartending. In a lot of ways, or, or having a modern classic on a uh, cocktail menu elsewhere. You know, it's very cool. The parallels exist, that's for sure. Yeah. So, Robert, you've got now, this is your your sixth book out. You got anything uh, in the pipeline that you want to talk about? 
Uh, there'll be a, another book uh, next year, and I've told you, Souther, it's going to be my last <laughs> cocktail book. It's it's uh, it's time to uh, move on. I mean, I'll still write about cocktails. I'm hoping that my publisher will let me write a book about hot dogs. My yes. agent is not very excited about this idea. <laughs> well, let's get uh, a petition started. Let's show them that there's interest. Yeah. Let's uh, use your Substack to to that end. Yeah, we're we're going to see uh, how much my publisher loves me when this proposal comes through. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but I really do want to write it. Um it's it's become an it's become an exciting topic for me. I mean, I want to read it to be honest. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, and eat it. Um, well, listen, you have the app, Modern Classic Cocktails, which has been around for a while. You and Martin Duderoff did this thing how many years ago? Yeah, that was about, that was the seed of this book. Mm -hmm. Um, we did that about six or seven years ago. Amazing. And it's still out there for people who want to get it. It's Mm -hmm. it's available on Apple. Unfortunately, only on uh, iPhones, you know, sorry, owners of other phones. Um, but, uh, that's still out there and now it's in, uh, book form. Because, you know, as long as the app has been out there... Nobody really knows about it. You know, I tell people and it's just like, how did I know, know, not know about this? It's just like it just kind of flies under the radar. So hopefully the book will be more visible, concrete presence. Well, you got to promote it here. You got to promote it on the book. You got to promote it on your own Substack, which again is called The Mix on Substack. You can go follow Robert Simonson over there. It's great. Lots of great content coming out. Cocktails, hot dogs, potato chips. Let's get it on. Um, And then I guess we'll stand by and look out for for your next book next year. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, it's always great to have you on. You're a great friend of mine. You're a great friend to the show. Um, really appreciate you being here and was very happy to come out and celebrate the launch of your book just the other night at Porchlight. So many great friends and faces there and everyone's really happy for you. I'm stoked for you as well. So Yeah, that was a good time. Thank you for coming to the, to the event and thanks for having me on the show again. Yeah, thank always. you, Robert. Yeah. Very fun stuff. Oh my God. Cocktails and hot dogs. I mean, Man. Who, who thought those two things would go together? I did. <laughs> listen, Every- nobody's going to eat. <laughs> listen, Colonel, no one's going to eat fried chicken from a bucket. Yeah. <laughs> Light bulb moment. Mm-hmm. Um, well, guys, it's been a lot of fun. Uh, it's always, you know, again, it's always fun having you on the show, Robert. And I feel like I've really, I feel like I've been like professionally bartending as long as you've been professionally writing about cocktails. So uh, another, another kind of lineup there. Pretty cool. Anyway, I think that's true. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah. I think I started in you know the mid aughts in uh, in Oklahoma, and then immediately moved to New York City and started doing it there. Um, so nice to uh, share a career path in uh, kind of a adjacent way of sorts. But absolutely, yeah. I can't wait to get into this book, not just because you featured one of my drinks, but thank you again, <laughs> by the way. <laughs> but but again, it is it's one of those things where nowadays, like when I make drinks at home. I keep it pretty simple and I like to, uh, you know, now that I am mostly in California, it's like, I feel like I'm, I know that like just from looking at the, the app and reading about these on Substack, but then now having the book, it's like, I get to hang out with my friends, uh, even though I'm out here in the country. Um, so I really appreciate that as well, guys. It's been great, um, catching up with all of you again, you know, we want to say a, a big thank you to all the people who came out. Uh, for Brother Cleve's mm-hmm. event on Sunday and, you know, for all the money that was raised for him. Uh, we absolutely miss him. Uh, what a powerful person in our industry, a modern mm-hmm. classic, if you will. Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> so on that note, I want to take us out. Uh, thanks again for listening to Speakeasy. Check out here at his radio network for many other programs like this one. And until next week, cheers, everybody. Cheers, guys. Cheers. cheers. So you don't shun the devil with your rock. The Speakeasy is powered by Simplecast. Thanks for listening to Heritage Radio Network. Food and drink radio supported by you. Keep in touch at heritageradionetwork.org slash subscribe. It's gonna get-